Hello and welcome to Intel on AI. I'm Ryan Carson, your host from Intel AI, and I am excited about welcoming Ian Gilmore, founder of Euler Digital to the show, and they are the creator of Bizoku, and we're going to talk a lot about that in just a minute. So Ian studied economics at university in the UK and then worked as a banker at Deutsche Bank and HSBC in the UK and the US and then worked for eight years in the UAE for IBM and PwC. Welcome to the show. It's good to have you here. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, thanks for having me. Good to have you here. So first of all, tell us all about Bizoku, what it is, how it works and and why you started it. Um, so we, um, uh, it's like really Great question, actually, because it, it, it kind of like um, it, it describes the last three, four years because we started, we bought a company uh, two years ago called AI Forum, um, just um, just uh, 2022, just as generative AI was starting to um, become popularized. Um, and we thought, well, we need to change that business model. Uh, and we started looking around, see how we could do it. Um, and then we realized that um, actually the, 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 the tools that we needed weren't available. So I went down the rabbit hole of how to build a model. And, you know, we ended up with um, a realization that there was actually some massive gaps in terms of the way that the landscape was evolving. And Bizoku. And what, what year is this roughly? So we start. We bought the company in 2022, and then we started to work on um, what was the uh, originally it was going to be a, um, a research model for AI Forum uh, using a technique called closed domain, um, and it just evolved into Bizoku, which we launched in uh, at the Levan Innovation Center in South Florida in November last year, um, and we've been building um, different different versions of that technology but now we're, we're ready to start putting out the beta so it's been the gestation period on this <laughs> one and a half years actually uh, wow so roughly what does it do give us the high level pitch so the high level pitch is it's a dialect based uh, low resource language system um so with the high resource uh technologies transformers are obviously voracious consumers of, of data um and, and the more parameters the more data the more you know parameters that you can load into the models the, the more performance, the lower the loss. Um, uh, that, that means that you need um, large, enormous amounts of, 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 of training data. Um, and, and the majority of the language models that are out there today support between 20 to 30 um, uh, high resource languages. English, French, Spanish, like when we're talking about large corpuses of data, it's primarily in these languages. Well, interestingly enough, when we talk about uh, bizoku, the derivative of the word is, is tribe and, uh, and culture from the word, the Japanese word zoku. Um, the, um, the interesting thing about uh, uh, English, for example, there's, there's hundreds of dialects. Um, and then we've got also, you've got um, uh, in Spanish, um, lots of dialects as well. Interesting enough, this that from the analysis we're doing for this podcast, there's 250 dialects of German. <laughs> really? Are, yeah, I was Did shocked. Not know that. I was really shocked. So the, the, the thing is about even the large languages, the dominant language, Portuguese, um, even Mandarin. Uh, Bangla's got 100 uh, uh, variants. Tamil's got 25 dialects. Each language, if this, if you imagine there's 7,000 languages in the world, we've only managed to sort of scratch the surface and get 30 done prop kind of properly but then there's all the dialects so when people look at language models uh they might think well they're done but in fact um that the, there's thousands of different ways that people communicate that are missing and our, our mission is to try and create a platform where we can actually uh, create uh, lower resource language capabilities at an affordable cost because these training these models is, is expensive so at a, at a high level what we're talking about is okay if folks uh, want to use English, which is the most well-supported language in the world. They're going to use a Llama, you know, 3.1, or or they're going to use a Mistral uh, large because these are trained primarily on English and they're very good at that. Um, but they're not going to be trained uh, on enough data from, say, Haitian Cre Creole, and and that community needs to be served. So how do you do that? Is that at its core? It, it is at its core. I mean, we could go, go down the rabbit hole of all the reasons to do it, but I think if you think of just low, all the lower resource languages, like Haitian Creole is a really good example. We're talking to customers in, in South Florida, and Haitian Creole is, is a really interesting use case because of uh, lots of different linguistics reasons, but predominantly because it's customer-driven. Yeah, I've been told yeah. by a customer they want it, so we're going to build it. Apologize, my yeah. light's going on and off in the pot. It's so. good. It, you're, now you're bright. I, I love it. Gonna, I think I have to keep moving <laughs> to keep the light on. Um, 
So the, the way we do it is we use um, a mix of open source, uh, sorry to get technical, but it's morphosyntactic data sets that are available from uh, resources like Universal Dependencies, which are decades old, incredible. You know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, in, in And what is that? I, I don't, I'm not aware of that. Basically, what does that mean? <laughs> So Universal Dependencies is um, a, 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 a they've they've created a set of standards and protocols and uh, they use something called um, tree banks, which actually help provide you with quite a lot of um, uh, taxon- tax- taxonomy data around languages, for example, which are common across different tree what are called tree banks, um, and we are able to access those um, if you like that that design that protocol. Um, and then we can use the um, off-the-shelf training materials, and then we augment that through partners. So Haitian Creole is a really nice example. But um, I know I'm, I'm talking to groups around the world. Um, Derija is a, a, it's actually Arabic for dialect, which is there's a really big group doing the Moroccan one um, who are based in Abu Dhabi uh, or some of the teams are in Abu Dhabi. Um, and then you've got uh, groups that are doing uh, Bangla, um, which is a very large uh, language um, in in Asia, um, across Bangladesh and parts of India. Um, um, and and to, to back up so everyone can understand what you're talking about. So it, in the end, a customer needs a model, a large language model that is specific to a low resourced uh, language like a Haitian Creole because they're going to build a support agent for that community or walk me through a really practical example. I'll give you a really example, a great example that I put out um, a, an article this week um, about uh, polling. So polling at the moment, polling is expensive to perform and to get like the 1000 or so sample size to make it statistically significant um, to actually ask those questions that, for example, in the US election, traditionally they've been doing in English, uh, <laughs> which is obvious, um, but they also try and use various um, Latin um uh, communities as well, so they're trying to use um, um, Spanish. Um, but if you think about um, the Asian community, there's 22 million um, Asian Americans, and if you think about Vietnamese, Mandarin, um, Cantonese, etc., they're not representing the polling data. So the polling organisations uh, are defaulting to using English and maybe some some d- derivative of Spanish, but they're missing because the pollers don't. The pollers don't speak the language to properly uh, call them. So if you want to put a robocall wow. together, for example, say you want to just use robocalling, oh, you, know, right. you wouldn't be able to do that unless you had the ability to actually semantically and syntactically uh, transpose that into another language or dialect. So there is a, a, a okay. massive gap. If you want to do everything in English, that's kind of supported today. But if you want to reach these communities, and some of them don't speak English, um, yep. or some of them speak English in a, a poorly. Yeah, so right. quite a, so polling's a really good example. Wow. Okay, so your customer would be a polling agency that wants to do a better job, therefore they're willing to pay to access the large language model that you've trained on a specific dialect uh, so they can do that. Interesting. Okay, so yeah. are you... Are you training these models from scratch? Or are you fine tuning? Tell us, like, don't go too deep, but tell us a little bit what's going on there. We, we are so insane. We are building <laughs> from scratch. Wow. We are building from scratch. Now, yeah, okay. I know it, it's, 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 um, I described it, um, the other day because I'm not Google. So I'm, I'm kind of climbing Everest in flip flops. Um, we're using, we're bootstrapping, we're using lots of different, the good, the great thing about natural language processing is it's, it's 40, 50 year old discipline there are so many different conferences around the world there's so much material and and capability out there so we're actually as i said earlier standing on the shoulders of giants we're building from first principles and we're using some really important um, insights from the community so we know that for example when you're doing training data there's a process called annealing um, where you use the best data last so you train on yeah, you train on some of the your training corpus um, to get the model up on its feet and we're starting to work. And then you give it a really big turbo thrust by using the best data last. And that gives you fantastic results. Um, and there's kind of those techniques and tricks of the trade that can actually get you a long way to where you need to get. Ultimately, low resource languages are by definition low resource. So you have to augment that data using various techniques like reinforcement learning, reinforcement learning from human feedback, um, annotation, annotations of data from partners, etc. So there's a lot of. Are you, are you actually using uh, synthetic data at all? That is a fantastic question. I'm going to wave again. Get the get the light back on. Now you're in, now you're in dark mode. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. So. 
Um, we um, uh, power saving, right? Um, we are um, we're having to um, uh, explore that to a certain extent. But I think synthetic data comes in after we train the model, and then we need to decide what we're sure. going to do with it. So synthetic data for question answer, for example, could be you've got your training corpus working, say for example in Haitian Creole, and then you could use a synthetic word generator to then create the question answer training data to do question answer right. for use case. Right. You'd have to train the base model first. So how are you acquiring the training data? Like, Because that must be a huge data science effort. Um, how does that work? So it's, it's really interesting. There's a ton of data out there just sitting on GitHub, uh, you know, Cobra Papers Hugging Face. Um, lots of different communities are also starting to pull together. So I'm, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm talking to groups in Morocco, uh, Bangladesh. Uh, I'm starting to reach out to some groups in Thailand. You're seeing them all popping up, which is quite encouraging because it means I'm not the only mad fool out there trying to do this. Um, the training data is is where the rubber hits the road. Um, but there's also some tricks that we can use to improve this. But the really the 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 hard work, the hard yards is is I break it into two sides: data science and then the, uh, the the machine learning. The data science piece is where we're really focusing our effort because if we can improve the amount and quality of the training data, then that will help us when we get into the modeling phase. Sure. Yeah, which is a lot of work. So <laughs> yeah, <it's not> easy. <laughs> absolutely. Okay, awesome. So uh, to, to sort of backtrack and, and restate what I'm learning here is uh, there are low resources languages uh, all around the world um, and our foundational SOTA models like uh, Llama 3.1 uh, haven't been trained enough on these low resource languages for people to use them to solve problems like a chatbot in Haitian Creole. And therefore, you're going out and identifying uh, these low-resourced languages uh, and, and finding the training data, you know, cleaning it, and then training a model from scratch uh, on, on uh, it basically, is it fine-tuned as a chatbot, or is it sort of a raw model, or is there versions here? I, I think what will happen with low resource languages, there are different use cases. I'll give you a really simple example. Um, if you're trying to talk to a very small uh, say you're a marketing company, you're a, a Procter & Gamble, and you want to shift some diapers in a particular market. Uh, and you know that maybe the Mexican community uh, are not necessarily responding as well to your communications. You might pick up a Mexican-Spanish uh, dialect and do a very targeted marketing with them using a very discreet uh, budget uh, and objective. Uh, and that could be very cheap because the, although building these models is, is quite time-consuming, um, to actually using the inference and the fine tuning for them using RAG, for example, is actually relatively inexpensive. So you can actually do a marketing campaign for like five, ten thousand dollars that will blow, you know, anything that's come before of it out of way. And and there's a there's a, there's a hyper. It's called hyper personalization. Is the sort of the concept that people talk about. It's like a McKinsey term where you really get down into or not the individual because that's impossible. But it's very focused but on closer. Yeah, much closer than we get the mass, mass market advertising that you get today. Wow. So um, are you offering this as an API that, that people, you know, run inference by an API or people running these models locally on-prem or something? Or like, yeah. how does this actually that's, get deployed? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, ultimately, we're hoping once we're up on our feet and we've got the scale, then it will become a, an API as a language layer for other models, multimodal models, for example. Um, but right now, um, because of the sensitivity of some of the data, so for example, if you're working in financial literacy or financial inclusion, things like that with underserved communities, this stuff will run on-prem, for example. Yeah. Sure. Also, one of the things we did at an Intel hackathon was we actually worked on homomorphic encryption. So actually the inference, so the input, the question, um, and then the model... Uh, and then the output, the inference output, would actually all be encoded using um, um, very high levels of encryption that, you know, are pretty much uh, unbreakable unless you're, unless you're, you know, wow. the NSA. So, so what, tell us, can you define uh, homomorphic encryption? Because uh, that sounds fascinating. Yeah. So there's, I mean, Intel's, uh, you know, we're working with Intel uh, on 
on this. And they, they call this category confidential computing and homomorphic encryption has been around for, for decades. Um, homomorphic encryption can work at endpoints. So if you're in the cloud, you can encrypt the data in and out of those endpoints. But what we've done is we actually did it at the Tensor level. So we used a library called uh, Tenseal, which is an open source uh, uh, library from Microsoft. And we uh, in the last hackathon, we ran um, homomorphic encryption at the Tensor level for a CNN. Um, and it was very successful. And you can run that on a CPU. So you can actually encrypt um, end-to-end. Uh, and we can use other secure channels like WhatsApp, for example, to make sure that, you know, the last mile, the entire interaction with the uh, the a cloud-based solution is, is encrypted. But you can also do that on-prem as well. Wow. Awesome. So let's kind of zoom out uh, for some of our listeners that are thinking about, okay, I've got data that I would love to train a model on. Uh, for a specific reason, I, I can't just use an off-the-shelf model, um, and so it sounds like they're going to have to go through some of this pain and learning that you have. So, can you share lessons that you've learned through this process so far? Well, the number one lesson is um, you make sure you've got the right engineers working on the job. Right. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say the success rate for me working with machine learning engineers is one or two in 10 actually have the chops to pull this off. Most engineers have never run a model from scratch. They generally will tinker around the edges of existing transform models. And and that's not a surprise, you know, Llama and, Gemini, all these guys have been spending $1,700 million on these things. Very few people. It's expensive. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, when, um, uh, um, Meta released the last, it was 3.1. That was a $500 million piece of technology that they opened. Yeah. Which was like, actually, still mind, mind blowing today. It so mind. it's unusual for, uh, you know, machine learning engineers out in the wild who are available to work with who've actually worked on these things. So the, the first one is getting the right people and doing the right jobs. How are you doing that? <laughs> What's your uh, secret? It, it, it is, I've got some amazing engineers that I work with. But, um, you know, it, we're a bootstrapping startup. So, you know, budgets are always a pressure. So we, you know, I use, I use points and equity to do it and, and my money. Um, but, but generally speaking, we just work with some really trusted people. I, when I bought AI Forum, I actually got an advisory board of really respected, distinguished machine learning engineers. And I just use that network to say, hey, I need help. Can you introduce me to five or six engineers? And through that, through people who worked at Google and all these other big firms, I'll find someone who's just transitioning into a new role or going in or out of academia. Got it. So thing one, good talent. What's, yeah. uh, what's talent, thing two? Talent is key. Then it's data. <laughs> um, yes. And then, it's, um, then it is really just like hard yards. And, and the other thing as well, that the other lesson, I'd learned, there is so much going on in this space. There's so much innovation that you can get dazzled and what mm. I do is I try and strip away the complexity by thinking, right, it's data and then it's right. processing. And, you know, if you, if you, if I spent all day trying to keep up with every single new type of model, you know, I would never get there. So I think what right. I've learned is that we, we have to cut away all the noise that's going on in the market because you just can't keep up. No one can. No. And it's, it's actually stressful and overwhelming. You think maybe I don't know about this and maybe I'm behind and maybe all the smart people um, are using this, but you're right. You end up being paralyzed instead of saying, uh, you're right. This is straightforward. I, I've got A and B and I know I need to make C. So yeah. um, just get to work. So how, how long is it taking you to train one of these models or like h- help us understand the scale or the time or. The- it, it doesn't take that long, actually, uh, from like doing the data pipeline and putting it through the model. It's relatively straightforward. It, the, the thing is, um, it's all of the iterative steps, you know, how many epoch. The, the thing about low resource languages is you run more epochs, right? So, um, and obviously the annealing process means that we end up working with lower lower sort of you know functional data so we end up with quite a lot of iterative steps that you wouldn't see in a normal language model you wouldn't run you know a thousand epochs on uh, a meta model because <laughs> that would like balloon out to sort of like quadrillion dollars to pay for it so we but but because we're trying to look for that signal in uh, out of the noise in very small amounts of data we have to get we have there's tricks of the trade so but to once you've got the pipeline working and you've got the model working then it's relatively straightforward because then the compute you know does the hard work because you just set hyperparameter settings up and off you go um, and and you, obviously there's a lot of uh, benchmarking we can run to work out when the we've kind of got got as much data out of each token as we can. So, but it takes I'd say end to end 
uh, one to two months. Okay. And, and that's um, starting. We're trying to speed that process up by aut- sure. automation. And so a couple, oh, I have a lot of questions now. So um, obviously at Intel, we love compute. Um, So I'm curious about your compute. Um, You know, what kind of uh, hardware rig are you running these training models on roughly? And how do you do all that? Yeah, so Series 5 CPU from Intel is great for running data pipelines. Um, And then GPU for us is is more than, I don't need a Gaudi to, um, you know, rocket ship to run my models because I'm not running on sort of, you know, 175 billion parameters. We're running on um, 500 million parameters. So oh, nice. they're almost levels, much smaller. Oh. And therefore, GPUs are more than capable of, especially sort of, you know, the, the modern GPU architectures. So, um, yeah, so really we're a CPU, GPU shop. That's great. Um, yeah. Um, and not a lot of this. We don't need a lot of data, a lot of storage either because, you know, we're li- literally talking about, uh, a gigabyte of information. Yeah, wow. It's it's really cool to actually hear that you're basically using a small language model. This idea of a 500 yeah. million parameter model is actually really exciting because it's way more efficient to run, you know, less power hungry. Uh, it, it's everything is better if it can be smaller. Um, so how, how are you doing your evals? Because, you know, if you've got a one to two month training cycle, obviously you want to be figuring out as you go how good um, is our output. And then as soon as the model is baked, how are you doing proper uh, evals? Are you using, well, are you using tools like weights and biases during the training run or, or like, tell me all about some of the tooling. So the qualitative area in LLP is pretty mature now. So um, we, we just run the standard set. The, we have uh, linguists in the team. So we also do qualitative testing as well. Or actual human beings <laughs> test the output. Uh, and the great thing about um, language is that it's actually um, syntactically quite uh, an interesting problem because you know we've got verbs and and co- uh, sorry we've got we've got adjectives, verbs, nouns. We've got well described, um, if you like, data, um, even though it's quite complicated to model um, semantically. Um, but the output to a human being is very easy to uh, inter- interrogate. So we're using humans as well because I might get a you know, an F1 score of whatever and various benchmarks kick off and you think, okay, we're state of the art. And then the stuff comes out garbage. Yeah. The other thing as well, low resource language it, models historically are very low uh, in terms of their, their power. They're um, the, it's very high. So that's another area where it's actually quite easy to become state of the art in low resource language models because the current state of the art is quite low. Wow. That's exciting. I, I think it's, it's really interesting to hear that there's all these specific use cases where people are realizing, oh, I could build a model to solve a specific problem if I have good data and I've got a good customer. Um, and I think we'll probably see an explosion of, of good ideas like Bazoku. We're not alone. A real need. We're not alone. I think the only difference between us and some of the other groups is that they're monolingual. They're just doing Thai or Derisia or they're doing um, a, a dialect of Bangla, whereas we're, we're thinking like we want to build a pipeline that can push through 50, 100, 200 dialects every couple of months. And, and then, re, you know, obviously these, these mo- language is organic. It grows um, mm-hmm. as well. Of course, you've got different generational perspectives. Yeah. So you think about the way Gen Z speak. I mean, there's so much going on in the US election at the moment talking about, you know, how uh, they're trying to both both sets of the campaigns. The Republicans and Democrats are trying to catch the youth vote. Gen Z, yep. the really important demographic now, and of course these these guys communicate in a totally different way. Speak differently. I know. I, I'm even seeing some of the changes with my kids. I've got a 16, a 13 year old, and it's just um, yeah, it's almost boring. So um, and and that's just in, in English. And right? that's so, in English, correct? So you've got these. Yeah. If you look at the Matrix, it's um, it's almost as tense in itself um, the way that language is used. But if you if you think about uh, it's a target rich environment. There's tons of places that this is needed. The question is, how do you crack the really hard bit of how do you create an industrialized pipeline to put through thousands of these in an economic manner? And that that's what we're trying to do. Is is we know that this is a there's there's lots of different groups working on this we're trying to industrialize the process to bring down cost because that means that we can increase representation in language models because at the moment if everything's done from there's this thing called homogenization of perspective if everything's done using a west coast perspective in english then guess what the people who are sitting in australia or you know in in vietnam 
I have a diff- slightly different perspective, cultural perspectives. Um, and therefore, that, that's another opportunity to increase representation. Yeah, it's interesting because your business uh, serves a real commercial need, but will a- also probably make the world better, right? Where, you know, there's companies who want to have hyper-personalized advertising that is relevant or be able to speak to their customers in a hyper-personal, accurate way in a low-resource language. But I, I, in addition to that, you have folks that also want to use a, a language model for intelligence reasons yeah. who didn't have access so that's exciting it is um, but I, I have to i have to say as well it is a bit of a um it's like it's a bit like kendy says we're going to the moon <laughs> everybody goes how are we gonna do that i am at that uh stage where we're still we're still experimenting but i think we're, sure. we're getting to a point where obviously working with intel um intel sort a lot of problems out and that you got one api and you got all this sort of cross platform there's lots of if you like the engineering work that we'd be needed to productionize is kind of on the shelf. So what we can do is we can focus on creating um, really efficient workflow um, and, and making sure that we drive down the costs so that when people come to start using this stuff, it's not a bespoke tailored experience. It's something because that would be expensive. Um, as I said, the budgets, you know, if you're looking at a, a, a sort of, if you've got a marketing campaign, it's three, four, five thousand dollars to really hyper personalize, then you could work that out. But if it was like a couple of million dollars to go and reach 25,000 people in a particular zip code, that's not going to work. No. So it's, it's financially viable at that scale, uh, at a smaller, uh, more affordable scale. So um, this has been fascinating. I've, I, it's really kind of lit off a bunch of neurons in my brain thinking about, oh, wow, there's so many exciting yeah. possibilities here. And I'm glad that you're tackling this challenge. I can see how it's going to make the world better and uh, help a lot of companies. So um, let's wind it down, but where can folks uh, find more information? Uh, where should they go? Uh, tell us all about it. Uh, well, we're a little bit stealthy at the moment. The website is <laughs> literally just sort of like one page. It's sort of because like, we're trying behind the scenes because, you know, we don't want to keep like putting out all these announcements saying we're going to do this, do that. We want to put some models out there that are actually working with customers and then we're going to mm. circle back. But, but but people can communicate with me. Um, we've got uh, there's a, a, a community app, bizoku.ai. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, they can email me at ian.gilmore.euler.digital. Um, uh, we're pretty, you know, pr- pretty, pretty, if you, you can find us. <laughs> um, and why do you, why do you spell Bazoku for everybody just so they know? It says B E Z O K U dot A I. Awesome. So one bonus question is, so as you start shipping these models, will you consider open sourcing them and putting, putting oh, them on hundred space? Yeah. So one of the things that I think for this bonus question, we're trying to gamify as well the creation of annotated data for training because um, we're going to need thousands of people who've got this expertise but don't realize they have it because they just speak it. So um, there's a there's a whole podcast there just talking about how do you in- increase the quality of human annotated data. But effectively, one of the th- – um, we're talking to a partner at the moment. Um, I hope I'm going to announce it shortly where we're going to try and gamify that experience. And then that will be – uh, that'll help create that. And then I think it's fair to then open source the stuff. There's going to be the data, I, I think, will definitely open source. Some of the models we may keep as proprietary. We haven't made that decision yet. Or they may be just completely open sourced. It's it's going to be down to, you know, an economic model to make sure that I can actually pay yeah. the bills. Yeah, because yeah. to me, I mean, I'm all for open source, but at, at the same time, it seems like to me your moat would be uh, – train the model and owning it and owning the data and then, you know, uh, charging people via an API. Well, but, uh, we've looked at the Red Hat type of business model. Uh, only Red Hat have ever made it work. Um, but, you know, there's lots of different ways of making uh, a buck to keep the lights on. Um, you know, the, the the exciting thing about this is, is that there's a real need. Um, we know the technology is appropriate. Um, we, once we've got a bit of traction with this, uh, we're, we're focused on South Florida because it's culturally so diverse. Um, and once we've sort of, if you like, um, got our technology into a good place, then we can start working out how much things cost and then how much we need to sell them for. And, and then we can work out, you know, but I think I think we would love, I know Intel's got a massive um, in, uh, open source um, uh, uh, following and we'd love to be part yeah, of that. Believe Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we were big believers in open source, which is what, like I said, why I always think open source first, but I'm I'm also an ex CEO entrepreneur. So thank you from that. (laughs) Yeah. And this has been really fun and, um, uh, I appreciate your time. I know you're busy. Uh, so thanks for joining the show and, uh, hopefully we'll see you 
in uh, online or in person at some point. Take care. Absolutely. Thanks, Ryan. Take care. Visit intel.com forward slash AI to learn more.